Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for, for rejoining us uh, again for the next, next session. Um, this session, uh, we're very pleased to welcome Raphael Pantucci. Um, Raffaello is the Director of the International Security Studies Program at the Royal United Services Institute in London. Uh, Raffaello has, has written widely on, on, on many topics uh, related directly to the major themes of this conference, uh, China and terrorism, Uyghur militancy, and also Chinese foreign policy in Central Asia more broadly. And Raffaello, as a, as a side point, also uh, has his uh, web, website, uh, China and Central Asia, with many, many useful posts about recent developments uh, with respect to Chinese activity and diplomacy in the region, and I'd highly recommend it. Uh, Raffaello's publications have appeared in a, in a, in a, range, of, a range of outlets, uh, including Survival, The National Interest, uh, and Studies in Conflict and Terrorism, and he has written widely uh, in a number of journalistic outlets, New York Times, Financial Times, and so forth. Um, so without further ado, I'd like you to, to welcome Raffaello, uh, and uh, hopefully some great material for conversation afterwards. Thanks, Raffaello. Thank you, Mike, and thank you again for the invitation uh, to come uh, to this really excellent conference um, that I think, uh, you know, uh, has brought together a whole bunch of people who are looking at some of these questions in a real level of detail, which I think is reflected in the conversations that we're having subsequently. Um, so it's, it's, it's great to be here, and it's great to talk specifically about this question of looking at Uyghur terrorism in a fractured Middle East. Um, so what I thought I'd do in my presentation, um, and I will try to stick within my parameters of my time, and if I'm not, someone throw something at me. Um, I won't be offended, um, is I want to kind of talk a little bit about um, the relationship between kind of Uyghur militancy and Al-Qaeda in particular. And I've just remembered that that is off. Um, I want to talk about the kind of history of um, Al-Qaeda terrorism and uh, Uyghur militancy. Um, I then want to talk a little bit specifically about what's happening in Syria, and in Syria to look in particular at what we've seen around um, Uyghur links to ISIL, and then Uyghur links to TIP, the Texan Islamic Party, which is sort of the overwhelming story there. And then finally touch a little bit on the relationship with Turkey um, and understanding that kind of dynamic a bit more. Um, and then sort of draw some broader conclusions. I'm not really going to talk about sort of Chinese relationships with the Middle East. Um, I'll touch upon it very briefly and I'd be happy to go on a, a, in more detail, but try to focus really narrowly on the sort of connection between Uyghur militancy and extremism and um, Al-Qaeda or jihadist terrorism. So first, um, you know, and, and, and there's going to be, in, there is inevitable duplication. And in, in sort of thinking about my presentation, listening to everyone else's, you know, stuff that Sean was talking about, stuff that Julia touched on, stuff that Professor May touched on, um, and stuff that Andrew was talking about, is all elements that have sort of been touched on already, which I'll, I'll end up going over in my presentation. But, you know, I don't think there's any way to avoid that. Ultimately, we're looking at a very narrow subject from a number of different lenses. Um, and so that's the reality of it. So to start by talking uh, briefly about the sort of history of Uyghur jihadism and its connections to um, Al-Qaeda in particular. And you know, in some ways, this is quite a short sort of discussion, because it's actually fairly limited. Um, if we're looking at sort of Al-Qaeda as an organization, um, or uh, you know, as a group that has been interested in China, or that has had sort of specific links with uh, trying to do things against China, um, it is actually very limited. Um, you know, we've seen, and as Andrew was talking about, some uh, you know, substantial evidence of uh, sort of Uyghur militants or people from you know, Xinjiang who wanted to leave the country, setting up shop in Afghanistan. And some of those people were connected with Al-Qaeda. But you know, historically, there really was very little evidence of a sort of direct connection between the two. Al-Qaeda seemed very focused on doing its thing of attacking the West and attacking sort of Middle Eastern regimes. And sort of Uyghurs were kind of just a group that existed within the milieu in Afghanistan that, um, that the Taliban created. And in fact, we could even go so far as to say, for some time, um, there was sort of an awkward relationship between uh, Al-Qaeda and Uyghur militancy in particular. If we go back and look at sort of uh, many of the discussions and comments and statements that have come out uh, of, uh, from the Taliban's rule of Afghanistan and the sort of relationship that um, the Taliban had with the Uyghur groups that had set up in the country, um, the overriding narrative that comes out of them is that the leadership at the time, Mullah Omar, told the group not to launch attacks in China from their territory in Afghanistan. So there was very much a desire to try to constrain and contain the group's interest in launching attacks against China. When we look to Al-Qaeda and talk specifically about sort of Middle Eastern jihadism, 
we can see that Osama bin Laden actually has an even an even an even you know stranger approach in some ways to uh, the relationship with Uyghurs and the relationship with China in particular. And if you look at some discussions and interviews specifically that he did in the Pakistani press pre 9/11, um, there was one moment where he actually even was discussing the idea of potentially seeing China as an ally. Uh, or someone that Al Qaeda could sort of think about working with, um, because at the time Al Qaeda was very focused on attacking the West and the United States in particular, and of course China was one that was a power that had a very and still does have a contentious relationship with uh, the United States. And so there was this question of a potential sort of alignment between these two. Um, there was a long interview in uh, in the Pakistani press that he did in 1999, in which he said, "I often hear about Chinese Muslims, but since we have no direct connection with people in China and no member of our organization comes from China." I don't have any detailed knowledge about them. The Chinese government is not fully aware of the intentions of the United States and Israel. These two countries want to use up the resources of China, so I suggest the Chinese government be more careful um, of the U.S. and the West. And sort of implicit within that is the sense of a potential alignment between the two. Um, in fact, if we go back and look at the sort of pre-9/11 period, um, where we do see a sort of interesting confluence between sort of Al Qaeda uh, terrorism and China. Is more in the fact of individuals, sort of parts of the Al Qaeda networks, traveling through China, specifically Guangzhou, and becoming part of the sort of large community of migrant traders that we saw in China that still sort of exists in Guangzhou,、um, sort of transiting through there. In particular,、uh, there was one. Egyptian businessman who had sort of links to Egyptian Islamic Jihad called Muhammad Ali,、um, who in February 2002 sort of seemed to take this relationship one step further、um, and actually established one of Al Qaeda's first sort of online websites. Specifically, this was one that he was doing for Egyptian Islamic Jihad, which is the group that、uh, Ayman al Zawahiri, the current leader of、um, Al Qaeda,、uh, was sort of in charge of, but was one of the organizations that had sort of come into the Al Qaeda、um, Ummah,、um, and he set up、uh, a website. Um, in、uh, you know from his base in China, buying sort of space on a Chinese server、um, called Malema Al Jihad, which means milestones of holy war. And from this particular website, he started to sort of publish material that sort of global、uh, you know jihadist leaders were sort of putting out. This was again the sort of pre 9/11 period,、um, but you know this was sort of the extent of the relationship you could see. Uh, with uh, between China and Al Qaeda, it was sort of a permissive territory that they could occasionally pass through. And I think, from the Chinese perspective, there was no particular interest in focusing on these people or seeing these people as a particular threat or concern.、Um, and when we're talking about Xinjiang and looking at sort of Uyghur militancy, there's very little evidence that any of these people ever went out to Xinjiang. I think it was a territory that was way beyond their interest or way out of their sort of focus of concern.、Uh, when we saw sort of Al Qaeda individuals traveling through China, it was very much through the sort of major transit cities of Hong Kong or Guangzhou, and this is something that continues throughout the sort of 2000s, where we see、um, individuals associated with Al Qaeda often using routes through China to travel around the world. And you know this fact that we've sort of continued to see this sort of occasional flow of individual figures who would sort of pass through China,、um, who were linked to Al Qaeda, was something that you know continued in the post 9/11 period.、Um, we've heard a lot of the discussion about sort of why、uh, you know why the United States、uh, decided to sort of list、uh, the East Turkestan Islamic Movement as a sort of terrorist organization in the wake of 9/11 to I think try to develop and get China on side in the sort of global war on terror the United States was fighting.、Um, But you know, I think that in a sort of material sense of the word, it's not very clear that we saw any sort of tangible shift. And from Al Qaeda's perspective, they continued to be an organization that was very much focused on launching attacks against the West or launching attacks against the Middle East. China doesn't really sort of come into their sort of peripheral area of interest or concern. Where we start to see that sort of narrative change、um, was arguably in the sort of late 2000s when we had the Beijing Olympics, and we first start to see videos emerging. From、uh, what was then called TIP, that was quite specifically targeting and talking about launching attacks against China. Now, the link between TIP and Al Qaeda is one that is sort of much debated, and sort of what point did the two groups really come together? But I would argue the sort of easiest and most obvious thing to point to is if you look at the first videos that emerged from TIP in 2008,、uh, that were sort of specifically were quite low grade things that were sort of put on the internet through YouTube,、um, which at the time was really not the model that you saw for Al Qaeda releasing its media publications. Its media publications had come out through sort of officially recognised media outlets like the Al Fajr Media Centre, and they were actually of a relatively higher quality. You would see sort of quite you know videos with a certain number of production qualities, interviews with people. It was a very sort of structured and well、uh, delivered thing for the time. Of course, now what we see ISIS doing is sort of wildly different.、Um, but what we see those first videos are ones that instead were very kind of low grade, very、uh, limited quality, and were just sort of dumped on YouTube and then released out for everyone to go watch there.
But after we see a couple of videos emerging through that uh, sort of format, we see Al Qaeda actually seeming to take the group into its into its kind of uh, into its orbit, and more formally starting to see some of its videos being released through the Al Fajr Media Center, and specifically coming out through media outlets that previously have been much more associated with um, Al Qaeda. And so, in some ways, there we can see that the two sort of seem to be coming together. And this sort of connection and a sort of willingness to acknowledge uh, the sort of Uyghur struggle and the Uyghur plight as sort of part of the global struggle that Al-Qaeda was shouting about, the sort of clearest evidence we have of it coming into um, Al-Qaeda's orbit is, of course, in the wake of the July 2009 riots, uh, where after we saw uh, the, the, the rioting in Urumqi, and there was, you know, a global surge of attention around what was happening with Uyghurs and what was actually going on in Xinjiang. Uh, before then, I'd argue very few people, um, uh, a few notable exceptions, many of whom are in this room, were sort of following the subject in any great detail, but it wasn't really something that anyone really focused on or knew much about. In the wake of that, we see a sort of surge in attention, and we see Al-Qaeda starting to talk about it as well. And one of the sort of biggest markers of this is one of the very prominent Al-Qaeda ideologues, Abu Yahya al-Libi, who's a very popular ideologue as well within the organization, very influential. Um, gave a, a speech in which he specifically highlighted the plight of the Uyghurs and talked about what had happened in Xinjiang and talked about it as something that, you know, was kind of fit within the broader context of what Al-Qaeda was thinking about. You don't really see any evidence of specifically trying to direct attacks against China or trying to do things in that direction, but you start to see basically it starts to come into the orbit of the groups and the places that Al-Qaeda leaders or individuals will talk about as uh, another, you know, battlefield in the global struggle that they're, um, that they're leading. Um, we saw, and we've seen other sort of groups uh, like this as well. Many of the others within the sort of Al-Qaeda orbit start to include Xinjiang or start to include China as one of the potential enemies of one of the countries that they're focusing against. But what we don't see through any of this period, and this is something that you really see consistently right up till very recently, um, is much evidence of Al-Qaeda dedicating resources to follow up on some of these statements. Where we see Al-Qaeda continuing to focus its attention is on launching attacks against the West or launching attacks against the apostate regimes in the Middle East that they are sort of focused on as their priority. Um, the sort of idea of targeting China and directing material and resources towards doing that seems very limited. In fact, there's really almost no evidence of it. What we do see is a couple of plots that start to sort of materialize in the sort of late 2000s, in 2009 and 2010, in which we start to see evidence of Uyghur individuals showing up in terrorist networks that can sort of broadly speaking be connected to the kind of Al Qaeda uh, Al Qaeda community. Um, the first one was in uh, in uh, 2008 when a couple of Uyghurs were arrested in Dubai, um, accused of trying to launch an attack on uh, Dubai Mall, uh, one that was uh, associated with China because it sold lots of Chinese products. In fact, it was owned by the the authorities of the UAE and was very much kind of a local thing. And these individuals. Um, were apparently individuals who, uh, there was two uh, Uyghurs, one of whom had apparently been recruited, um, and we get all this information from court documents that were released uh, in, uh, in UA, um, in association with the, with the sort of court case. Um, an individual who seems to have been first recruited by individuals who he claimed were linked to eat him um, at the time in 2006 when he was potentially going on Hajj in Saudi Arabia. It's not exactly clear where in Saudi Arabia this sort of recruitment take, took place. Um, he was then sort of recruited there. He then went to do some training in Waziristan. And then from there, seems to be given direction by someone within ETIM tip. We don't exactly know. Um, the names, he doesn't provide a sort of exact name of the individual. He just says it was a deputy leader in the organization um, that was uh, fighting in Waziristan to go back and launch an attack in Dubai. Now, this is sort of an odd uh, choice of targets on the one hand, but it's also an odd choice of individual to launch this kind of attack. Because this guy, uh, whose name was... Um, uh, whose name was a uh, very long Uyghur name, which I'm going to mispronounce, Mehtmi um, Maima um, Yitming Shalmo. He uh, did not speak any English, did not speak any Arabic, um, and was being sent back to launch you know, a terrorist attack by himself um, in Dubai. So he recruited another individual who he found on the ground, and this individual helped him start to at least assemble some of the chemicals that would be required to launch a plot. Somewhere along the way, the authorities got wind of this um, and clamped down very heavily and arrested them almost immediately after they sort of discovered them and then put them into the court process. And both individuals were convicted of terrorist offenses. But interestingly, it's worth noting that um, in Dubai, if you are convicted of terrorist offenses, it is sort of an instant capital offense. Uh, but the judge in this case decided to waive the capital punishment because he said the plot was in such an immature phase that it wasn't proper uh, for them to be uh, sentenced to death. And they both received 10 years in prison. 
The next plot, which in some ways is more interesting in trying to sort of paint, uh, try to understand the link between sort of Al Qaeda and um, and the sort of Uyghur uh, militant networks, is a plot that was disrupted in Oslo in July 2010, where there was a in- group of three individuals, uh, one of whom was Uyghur, another was Uzbek, and the other was Iraqi. Um, who were accused of trying to launch some sort of an unspecified plot against the target um, in Oslo. Now this network or this cell was disrupted. Um, and the reason it's sort of interesting its connection with Al-Qaeda, in that the three individuals, one of them, the sort of lead, the, the Uyghur individual, a chap called Mikhail Davud, which is a name he'd, uh, he'd changed by deed poll uh, when he'd moved to Norway, um, was an individual who was talking to an email account that was also in contact with plotters in, north of, in the north of England and plotters in the United States, who were part of very sophisticated plots that were trying to launch attacks directed by Al-Qaeda leadership against the United States and um, the United Kingdom. And this same email account was also talking to this individual in Norway. And so, you know, the authorities were sort of watching this plot for a very long time, um, but it was very unclear how much there was actually some evidence of activity happening. Mikhail Davud seems to be a fairly radicalized individual who was talking to Al-Qaeda-linked extremists who were based in, uh, in Turkey, um, who were based in Waziristan. Um, and you know, there was sort of ample evidence that he was an individual who had clearly been to a training camp, received some sort of indoctrination, and maybe had an idea to do some sort of a plot. But the other two people in the plot didn't really seem to know what was going on. One of them was, in fact, reporting to the authorities. Um, was actually sort of telling the cops about what was going on. So the cops had a very sort of uh, a good sense of what was actually going on with this plot. Um, the reason he was actually arrested in the end was he hadn't told them everything that he knew was going on, in particular the fact that they had actually managed to source some chemicals and had started to talk about actually doing a specific plot. The other thing that's interesting to note about Davoud is that he um, appeared to have in his possession some photographs of some other Western uh, jihadists who were linked to Al-Qaeda um, and were part of networks um, in the United Kingdom who, you know, had disappeared for a very long time. Um, authorities had lost track of them, and they were known to be somewhere in Waziristan. They were maybe suspected to have done a drone strike, but no one really knew. Um, and Mikhail Davoud was found to have passport-sized photographs of them, which is an interesting element to sort of think about, um, because it seems there what we're having is we have an individual who was connected to sort of uh, some of the tip at this point, it was sort of tipped. There was a particular individual called Commander Seifullah who um, was talking to Davoud by telephone. Um, it seems as though this sort of connection that definitely flowed through a sort of Uyghur network was being used by Al-Qaeda to potentially try to launch some sort of an attack. It did remain a fairly immature plot, though. And actually, when, we, when the individuals were arrested, um, it wasn't very clear what they were going to target. They all sort of gave different reports about what the ultimate target was. Davoud said, I want to target the Chinese embassy, but it's not clear that there was any clear evidence that he'd actually planned or done much preparation in terms of targeting that specific place. Rather, he was sort of talking about doing a plot. He seemed to have half persuaded one of the people he was talking to. The other one, as I said, was actually talking to the authorities at the same time. But you know, it's a sort of interesting element in terms of showing that you have an individual who's definitely part of a sort of Uyghur community of radicalized individuals, goes through training camps there, and then becomes a tool that's being used by Al-Qaeda to try to launch an attack of some sort. The actual reason why the authorities arrested him was that the very day before that they sort of launched the arrest against these individuals, um, they, um, they had unsealed some documents in the United States about the American network, the American end of this plot. And there was concern that with this information getting out, suddenly these individuals would be alert to the fact that someone was probably onto them and might you know, run away or launch action to sort of get ahead of, uh, get ahead of authorities. So the decision was instead to move quickly and detain and arrest them. But you know, suffice to say, in this long sort of history of connections between China and Al-Qaeda, it's very unclear to me that there's any direct evidence of Al-Qaeda trying to launch specific plots or attacks or dedicate much resources towards supporting the Uyghur cause or launching attacks against China. So fast forward to today, to Syria and Iraq, and I'm conscious I've gone on a little bit, so I will try to be concise in this. What I want to talk about now was looking at what we're seeing happening in Syria and Iraq, and to talk about it through three sort of lenses. Um, the first is to talk about it through ISIL, um, and looking at the sort of the ISIL community and the link that we see with Uyghur uh, extremists there. The second is to talk about TIP, and the third is to talk about the relationship with Turkey. Now on the one hand, if we're looking at sort of Uyghur jihadis, or you know, jihadis or extremists from China going to fight in Syria and Iraq, it's not really that surprising or novel. You know, pretty much you know, every country that has some sort of a Muslim population has got some sort of representation on the battlefield in Syria and Iraq. I think the last count I'd seen was somewhere in the region of 90 plus countries had individual nationals who'd been identified on the battlefield. And this is everything from people from Chile, uh, people from North America, people from 
you know, Australia, from New Zealand, from across sort of Asia, really, you know, all sorts of countries that you never imagine have had individuals who've been radicalized to go and fight. So the fact that we're seeing, you know, Chinese nationals, uh, be they Uyghurs or, pretend, or even, uh, you know, other ethnicities as well, is really not surprising within that context. And you sort of have to just start to understand Syria as a sort of real flame on the jihadist sort of map, uh, which is drawing in moths from sort of all over the place. Um, but, you know, understanding exactly what the nature of that connection is, in particular when we're looking at Uyghur extremism, is, is really interesting and very specific. And um, to start looking at uh, the ISIS question in particular, what's interesting about the ISIS connection is we can see that we actually do have some sort of data that we can use to understand what is the sort of nature of this link in the form of various documents that have leaked out from the organization um, that uh, are sort of entry forms for individuals who are sort of going to join the group. Um, this large lump of documents is one that leaked out uh, sometime, I think, a year or two ago, um, and that various institutions have sort of got different parts of and have started to sort of publish around. Um, my, my NC Rusi was lucky to get a sort of portion of these documents, and so what I'll, I wanted to quickly do was basically go through some of the other researchers who've managed to get access to the documents, some of the findings they've had, looking specifically at the sort of Uyghur networks that show up in there, and then also compare it a bit to what we'd sort of found in the research that we'd done around the documents we have. So the three reports that were sort of um, that that had emerged was one was that was mentioned before yesterday by Sean, which is by a chap called Nate Rosenblatt at the New America Foundation, and then another was one that was released by Brian Dodwam, Daniel Milton, and Don Rassler at the Combating Terrorism Center at West Point. Um, both of these in you know groups of researchers got access to these documents, um, though you know the numbers of documents they have vary; they don't match up. Um, we also got access to it, and our numbers don't match up with what they have. So I suspect we're all getting different pieces of kind of the same jigsaw. Um, and the jigsaw is one that is, uh, is very confusing. Uh, but in essence, what you're looking at is a series of different documents. One is entry and exit forms. So people who are coming to join ISIL, and when they're coming to join ISIL, they have to kind of fill out a basic number of information, their name, where they've come from, what their sort of level of knowledge of uh, jihadi ideologies is, what training they've had, what they sort of are here to do. And then others are some exit forms. So people who are leaving uh, the Islamic State to go out to mostly Turkey to connect with family or do things there. But then also some of the other ones, and this is one that we particularly seem to have got access to, that others don't seem to have been reporting about, but I don't know, maybe they just haven't started talking about it, is documents which appear to show um, people who are participating in specific training camps. So individuals, you know, the sort of training camp, the guy who leads it is saying, okay, so who's in the camp? What are these individuals? And they have a sort of a large Excel sheet which basically has uh, all the information about the fighters who they've trained in this particular sort of month um, in this particular camp. And so these are the sorts of various sources. And the sort of analysis that we've seen so far has been uh, fairly superficial from the others. And I say that not to, uh, you know, deride their research, um, but more because looking at the Uyghur community within this hasn't been a sort of focus of their attention. So when we look at the sort of Nate Rosenblatt report, um, we see that he uh, identifies 118 individuals within his data set who are from China, of whom 114 were identifiable as from Xinjiang. Um, we see that only very few of them were identified as having any previous employment. Only two of them were reported as having a professional job, and over 70% had never left China before they decided to come to Jihad. Um, we also see that there is a huge disparity in the age range that he reports. Um, the youngest person he's able to identify is 10 years old. The oldest is 80, um, which is a pretty broad bracket. Um, there is no evidence of any of them having said that they fought jihad previously. And this is an interesting data point that he picks up, which doesn't correlate with some of the others, was that 73% of the cases he looked at of his under 18 um, were individuals who had joined after um, the Islamic State had sort of announced its caliphate. You know, so after that sort of big revelation, there seems to have been, in his data analysis, there seems to have been a surge of people, Uyghurs in particular, going to join um, ISIL. The CTC report instead identifies 138 cases on the basis of Chinese citizenship in their response, but 167 on the basis of where their residence is. Um, you know, so some people don't necessarily identify their citizenship, but they do identify, you know, where they were living before. Um, all of the cases that they look at, they identify that only six of this group are people who identified as having an advanced knowledge of the religion that they're purporting to fight for. Um, the unemployment numbers that they register is very different, with only between 10 to 17 percent as registering as unemployed. And the reason there is a bit of a disparity there is that often people don't put anything in some of these forms. These forms are clearly badly filled out. So in some cases, you'll see the person saying, yeah, I was doing this job. In others, it's just a blank spot. So you don't know. Does that mean he's unemployed? Does that mean the guy didn't ask any question? Who knows? Um, 
but you know, the, the data does seem to point that there is a higher level of employment amongst them. Um, 25 of the cases that they identify don't say that they want to be suicide bombers, um, which is a relatively high proportion uh, in comparison to the other countries, sort of Middle Eastern countries like Saudi Arabia, um, uh, Lebanon, and Libya are sort of ones that also ha have higher sort of proportions of people who are willing to go and fight and die uh, for the organization in this way. Um, and they uh, identify that there were seven Uyghurs amongst the individuals who were identified in exit forms as trying to sort of leave the territory um, in a, in a, in, at some point in time. The analysis of the data we had was we were only able to identify, I think it was 28, um, that would have a definable link to Xinjiang or Uyghur. And you could tell this because of the address of where they were from, because they would identify themselves as Turkestani, um, or a telephone number that they provided on the forums was uh, a clearly a, a Chinese one. Um, and of these uh, 28, the average age of them was around 24. The oldest we found was 43 and the youngest 16. 17 of them were married, with many of them saying that they have multiple children. Uh, one of the exit forms we had is of an individual who was going out of the country to bring back his family to um, the Islamic State. Um, and some of the other interesting data which we're able to identify is some of these travel patterns. Um, which, you know, they, they, they seem to follow a path which we'd sort of identified before, as we mentioned a few times, which is of traveling sort of through Malaysia, um, specifically a, lot, a number of them identify Kuala Lumpur as a place that they go to, um, and then from there to Turkey and then into Syria. But again, it's slightly confusing because if you look at some of these, the forms, it says, you know, the, the, the sort of specific question is, you know, have you been to other countries before? And it's not clear if some of these people are answering that question is in, I have traveled to countries, and they sort of provide a laundry list of places that they visited, whereas other people are clearly identifying the route that they took to get um, to Syria and Iraq. One of the odd cases we came across is a chap who identified himself as a former footballer, <laughs> um, who uh, had traveled through the Italy, UAE, and Russia, and Malaysia before he'd come to fight in the Islamic State. Um, he was also interesting because he was part of a cluster of three guys who identified as individuals who'd actually fought with TIP, uh, the Texan Islamic Party, before they decided to go join ISIL. Um, there's no reason given why they made this choice. The only sort of common thread that we could find between them is the individual who they say uh, referenced them into the organization, the sort of recommender, is the same person. So that's the only link. The times that they decide to go join ISIL don't match up, um, you know, but they all appear to use the same chap, Abu Muktil, as the individual who sort of gets them into the organization. One of our guys actually said that he had fought jihad before saying he'd fought jihad in East Turkestan. Again, we've no real idea what this means. <laughs> Another one, not the same case, is an individual who said he'd been a convict and served some time in prison. Um, but I think the real key thing is that it's a very, it's a, it's a kind of mixed bag. And you know, if we're looking at this group, it's not totally clear that we can draw anything out of it. Um, some of the interesting data points which are relevant for China in particular um, is that none of them, you know, there is no element or discussion within any of these documents of these individuals wanting to launch attacks back in China or expressing an interest in that regard, they were very much focused on sort of joining the Islamic State and participating in the organization there. Um, an interesting thing which a few of them mention is that when they get to the question of do you want, you know, who's your kind of next of kin, who would you like us to contact in the event of your, uh, your demise, um, a lot of them leave it blank, a couple provide phone numbers, but actually about four of them say specifically they don't want to communicate with their parents because they're worried that the Chinese will take them. Which is interesting if you think about it, because in the context of what we're seeing here is documents that these individuals are giving to ISIL, the group they're going to fight with, and they don't trust that ISIL is going to have sort of you know protection of their data. <laughs> they're that concerned, you know. There's a sort of which is an interesting uh, sort of data point about the level of trust and you know uh, and the faith that they have um, in the organization. So you know this is uh, this is sort of what we've been able to draw from this data, which is frankly fragmentary and confusing, but I think in many ways reflects what you see in a lot of the other countries in this data set, which is that you've got a very wide range of people who are going to fight alongside ISIL. You're seeing these people are coming from all sorts of different backgrounds. You're seeing people with professions. One of these guys identifies himself as a surgeon. Uh, there's people with university education. There's people with no education. It's a very sort of mixed bag of people. In terms of looking at the output of material that we're seeing um, ISIL put out. Um, we haven't really seen any Uyghur videos emerge. There was one Nasheed, a religious song that was put out in Uyghur, um, but we haven't seen much evidence of the organization sort of focusing its attention specifically on the Uyghur community. They seem to very much see it as part of the sort of broader radicalized individuals who are being drawn alongside them to help them sort of build their state. In contrast to this, 
Um, if we look at the Turkestan Islamic Party, we can see we're instead looking at an organization that has really quite uh, single-mindedly continued to focus its attention on its kind of core constituency. The exact numbers of people who we see fighting with a tip uh, in Syria and Iraq is very unclear. Um, I think you know, we could broadly say that we're probably talking about the hundreds, but whether we're talking about up to a thousand, I, I just don't know. Um, I say hundreds on the basis of, if we look at the videos that they put out fairly frequently and the fo photo footage that we see, we see a lot of material and we see a lot of people sort of there, you know, and a lot of people who are identifiably uh, potentially Uyghur. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's often hard to tell, but you know, there is clearly quite a substantial number of people. In terms of where they're fighting, they're fighting all over the country. You know, they tend to fight more alongside some of the Salafi jihadi groups, so groups like Jaish al-Fath, uh, al um, Akhar al-Sham, and Jabhat al-Nusra, um, uh, which has, of course, changed its names recently. And they tend to fight alongside them, but they do tend to also seem to be a fairly autonomous entity. Um, we've seen them recently participating in, uh, in the breaking of the siege in Aleppo just before the attack. They put out a video which sort of celebrated the fact that they're going to participate in it. And we've also uh, seen them showing up and fighting in Latakia. Um, so you, we can see that they're an organization that seems quite substantial. In the videos they put out, we can see that there's lots of uh, uh, evidence of them having quite a lot of hardware, military equipment um, that they're sort of using to, uh, to launch, uh, to fight against uh, the regime. And they seem very much aligned with the kind of Nusra and um, Al Qaeda strain and Salafi jihadi strains of the battlefield rather than the kind of Free Syrian Army or certainly ISIL. Um, I'm, I'm conscious a bit of the time, so I'm going to compress myself a bit here. Um, and say that there's sort of two other videos which I think are useful to highlight uh, within this context of uh, TIP in particular, because I think they sort of help uh, feed the bigger picture. One is a video that was released recently by Amin al-Zawahiri, in which he, it was part of a sort of broader collection of videos that he, that he put out, which were called the Islamic Spring. Um, and these were essentially a bunch of videos uh, where he sort of delivers a monologue over a montage of footage of various sort of jihadi battlefields and jihadi leaders, um, in which he sort of uh, rejects the Arab Spring, and says, you know, this is a huge failure and our, our struggle is a much better one. And he also fight, rejects um, ISIL. But in one of these videos, he very specifically talks at considerable length about uh, Uyghurs and the East Turkestanis. And notwithstanding what I'd said before about Osama bin Laden quite clearly saying we have no contact with these people, um, you know, Zawahiri seems to remember a very different time and a very different picture. Um, he recalls Hassan Maksum as one of the great leaders of jihad, putting him up in the sort of pantheon of leaders of Abdullah Azam, the famous uh, Palestinian who's sort of the father of the Soviet jihad, um, and Osama bin Laden, Abu Musab al-Zarqawi, the sort of founder of, um, of um, ISIL's uh, precursor organization, Al-Qaeda in Iraq. Um, and he says the East Turkestani warriors fought alongside Al-Qaeda in Tora Bora and were active members of the sort of Mujahideen there. He specifically says, Afghanistan's mountains and valleys know well the Mujahideen from East Turkestan. Now, this is sort of a slight remembering of history, um, if we go back and think to what Osama bin Laden said about them before. But I think suffice to say, Al-Qaeda seems very keen to embrace this organization, go some length of praising what it's doing in Syria and Iraq, and saying that TIP is very much its kind of entity on the battlefield. The other interesting video to highlight uh, within this context is another video that emerged fairly recently in which um, um, uh, the, the, the sort of long suspected dead but then sort of revived uh, from the dead um, uh, uh, tip, uh, tip leader, Abdul Haq, um, released a video. Again, it was one of these ones we have a sort of audio message over a whole montage of various footage in which he talks up sort of what the group is doing in Syria. This thing that emerged fairly recently, I think it was in May. Um, and in it, he sort of praises the, 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 the conflict that they're doing and says all the wonderful things that they're achieving on the battlefield and that they're really part of the sort of Al-Qaeda Dumma. He praises a number of the sort of prominent jihadi uh, Al-Qaeda leaders. And he goes to some length to talk uh, angrily about ISIS and sort of shout about ISIS and how this is a evil organization and one that they sort of reject and it's leading Muslims in the wrong direction, not fighting the correct jihad. Um, he also goes at some length to uh, berate the leadership of the Islamic movement to Uzbekistan, saying that this organization is sort of a busted flush and their leadership has you know, made the wrong choice of going uh, to support ISIL. Messages which very much fit in with the sort of broader uh, picture of what we see um, Al-Qaeda uh, talking about uh, when it's fighting um, in Syria. But within all of this, well, in all these videos that I've sort of talked about, the one thing which is noticeable is the lack of many direct threats against China. Abdul Haq's video, he does quite specifically talk about the sort of conflict in Syria as being something where the group is training and fighting to gain experience to ultimately go back and launch jihad at home. But, you know, uh, Zawahiri never explicitly makes the threat of launching an attack against China. And a lot of the videos that Tip put out separately, they seem to be much more focused on fighting the jihad in Syria. 
it's very much talking about what we're doing here and talking about how Muslims in, in Xinjiang are oppressed and should take advantage of this struggle to come and join it and to come and fight, rather than, you know, let's all uh, launch attacks against China. So to sort of conclude a bit on, on, the, on the sort of Turkey angle, which is something that has been touched on before, I think Turkey is clearly uh, is, is a really interesting question and uh, understanding exactly what the nature of the relationship between Turkey and uh, specifically the sort of Uyghur groups is is very difficult. You know, there is a, a strong history of uh, the uh, President Erdogan having a lot of sympathy for the Uyghur cause and, you know, being quite vocally sympathetic towards them. Uh, in his time as mayor of um, Istanbul, uh, he sort of, you know, created a, the Martyrs Park, which was clearly uh, venerating some uh, previous uh, Uyghur leaders at AKP rallies. You will regularly see the sort of Turkestani flag, the blue flag being flown by some of the supporters there. Um, you know, and I think that it's, it's, if we look at the numbers of uh, Uyghurs who are showing up in other countries with, you know, seemingly legitimate Turkish travel documents, um, it makes you wonder there must be some sort of an official complicity at some level uh, with this transit of people who are sort of leaving the country, some of whom are ultimately showing up on the battlefield in Syria. And in some ways, uh, why I think China should begin to, why China I think is beginning understandably to worry about this and understand a little bit where this is going, is that we've also seen from this sort of flow, um, and again, we don't know exactly where the sort of lines are drawn between the Turkish state or individuals who are part of the Turkish state acting on their own volition, or others who are just sort of, you know, uh, uh, Turkish nationals uh, or, or whatever, um, is the incident that we saw in the Irwan Shrine. Um, and the bombing, which was quite clearly targeting sort of Chinese tourists there, which is clearly linked to the sort of human smuggling net that was helping, uh, that was working with Uyghurs to get out of China, in some cases to, uh, to get over to Turkey, and some of them ending up uh, fighting. Because in that particular attack, we can see an incident of, you know, a specific targeting of Chinese interests and Chinese nationals as a result of the sort of Uyghur uh, struggle. And that is not, you know, if we look back at the history, there has been very limited evidence of this actually taking place, or China being specifically targeted. Um, I think, you know, Andrew pointed out some cases in Pakistan, um, and I think that speaks to sort of Pakistan-China relationship and a desire by the group to sort of strike the Pakistani state through uh, the sort of Chinese. Um, but we hadn't really historically seen this happen. Where we had seen it happen was, you know, for example, it tended to be by chance. So Chinese nationals happened to be in a place when it was attacked by a sort of Al-Qaeda group. And Al-Shabaab was actually quite pragmatic about this. Uh, when in, uh, uh, in July uh, 2015, they rocketed a building in downtown Mogadishu, it turned out it was a hotel that you know, the Chinese embassy was in. And in fact, a Chinese guard was killed. And the group immediately put out a video afterwards saying, yes, this was you know, in sympathy for our brothers in Xinjiang. There is no evidence that there is any, <laughs> that this is a premeditated act with any sort of conscious effort. It was purely a sort of opportunistic effort uh, by al-Shabaab to take advantage of a thing which had happened sort of very much by chance. But what we see in the attack in Erwan Shrine, and I'd argue what you're seeing in this kind of relationship with Turkey, which is, I think, one that is very tense and very unclear, and you've got a, a government that has some level of uh, tacit support or overt support for um, the Uyghur cause, you have a very interesting and worrying dynamic, I would argue, for China in which you do have a sort of potential for something to escalate into something which is more directly targeting their interests as a result of what is sort of happening in Xinjiang. And that is a sort of novel twist that, um, that I think is clearly going to concern Chinese authorities going forwards. Um, and I think, you know, if we look at TIP and we think about it as an organization that seems very focused on what's happening in Syria and Iraq and fighting the sort of battlefield there, um, I would say that, you know, uh, a lot of attention, probably excessive amount of attention, is often focused on ISIL um, as kind of the main threat that we see in Syria and Iraq. This is an organization that's been around since, you know, the late 90s and has sort of waxed and waned in its size and capabilities. Al-Qaeda has been a consistent presence throughout this time. And I think there's very strong evidence that part of the reason why we saw Jabhat al-Nusra change its name recently was part of a very conscious effort um, because, you know, the group changed its name. And when it changed its name, Al-Qaeda recognized that it had changed its name. You know, which theoretically, if you're breaking away from a group, it's not going to be acknowledged or praised by the group that you're leaving. Um, and I think what we're seeing there is the group is basically trying to win uh, effort on the battlefield and show itself as the one that is really protecting the sort of Ummah in Syria and fighting against the Assad regime as a way of kind of refreshing um, the Al-Qaeda brand. You know, it's a brand which had been very tired over time and had lost a lot of its appeal. But to sort of win a battle like this in the sands of the Levant, um, potentially means that then going forwards, you could see it uh, using that as a springboard to continue its sort of longer term struggle of um, attacking the West. And if we think about it within that context and the fact that TIP is so closely aligned with this organization and fighting alongside them and clearly quite closely linked to them, um, 
that presents a sort of worrying trajectory going forwards. Or if this group is able to secure territory, you know, maybe it's focused on fighting the battle here in Syria and Iraq now, but wait five to 10 years, you could see an organization that feels more confident and wants to actually do something about the biggest struggle it's always been talking about. And I've gone way over my time, so I apologize. Fantastic. Thanks uh, so much for that presentation, Raffaello. Um, I'd now like to invite Dr. Kirill Nazanov um, to give his impressions and, and comments on, on Raffaello's paper. Uh, Kirill uh, is a colleague here at ANU at the Centre of Arab and Islamic Studies. Over to you, Kirill. Thanks, Michael. It was uh, a brilliant presentation. We learned an awful lot. And uh, I would particularly like to highlight the detailed and richly textured nature of information that uh, Raffaello shared with us. It's indeed a rare occurrence uh, that uh, there is no fluffy stuff here. It's all based on hard data. Uh, I did have a couple of questions, actually, that um, hmm, uh, sort of intrigued me throughout the presentation. And uh, uh, Rafael, of course, provided us with a great picture of uh, who those Uyghur militants are loitering in Syria, Iraq, and uh, elsewhere in the Middle East. Uh, when they came to the region, what they are doing, what kind of plots they participated. And of course, uh, the, um, one of the great discoveries here is uh, the continuation of the old association with Al-Qaeda, dating all the way back to the time um, uh, of the late 1990s and early noughties and uh, continuing today. And uh, I can't overemphasize the importance of the, of the discovery with which I totally agree that uh, the um, uh, link is uh, quite often on the individual level. It's the continuity of personnel. It's people who know people mm. who migrate from one side of jihad to another. And uh, I think that uh, rings true for me. But still, this uh, did generate a question for me. Um, can we stop there? Can't we look at the bigger question as to why? Why the um, uh, Uyghur militants currently located in Syria or in the Middle East uh, solidarized uh, with uh, well, either ISIL or well, Al-Qaeda offsprings, Jakarta Nusra, what have you. Um, there were some crumbs and the bits and pieces in the presentation that provided us with some clues. Uh, so uh, Raffaello mentioned uh, Ayman al-Zawahiri and uh, his take on uh, the continuity, ideological continuity uh, between uh, Uyghur militants and uh, Al-Qaeda. But then uh, Raffaello made a statement that uh, what the Uyghurs might be doing in Syria right now is protecting the Syrian Ummah which is kind of a bit divorced from what uh, Zawahiri is saying. And, that, uh, and yet, uh, also, there are discourses uh, that uh, whatever Uyghur militants are doing in Syria today is targeting China. This is the weakest discourse of them all, according to your uh, findings, well, perhaps. So that's uh, in a nutshell. Uh, I think the paper would benefit from uh, an, al an analysis of ideological frameworks that assorted groups of uh, Uyghur militants in the Middle East are deploying to mobilize and to translate to the, re the rest of the world as to why the hell we're here, why are we fighting, and why we're fighting in a particular way. And um, one uh, suggestion that might be useful in this is to um, an analyze the uh, statements, the speech acts by the leaders of Uyghur militants in the region as to, well, obviously they all come from the same Kurdist Mm. stable. Mm. But uh, which trend, could mm, uh, this takfir uh, wahidr kind of uh, logic do they follow? Indeed, it can be um, uh, Azam and uh, Ayman mm. al-Zawahiri, or on the other hand, indeed, they may have embraced uh, Baghdadi. And uh, 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 this can be gauged uh, in quite a simple method. It's just uh, having a look as the two, what they understand by the notion of jihad who are the targets of jihad, jihad uh, for the Uyghurs in Syria? Are they uh, aiming at the near enemy or the uh, outside enemy? And uh, I think uh, most importantly, we should look, uh, we should be looking as to uh, who are the objects of, the, of this jihad. Mm. So one litmus test may be whether women and children in the pro-Assad territories are included or excluded. Uh, mm. And uh, this uh, may go a long way to identifying the uh, Uyghur militants with uh, one stream of Kudbist ideology or the other. Uh, the second question, uh, and you covered it masterfully, I thought, uh, is about the exact extent, the dimension of the Uyghur militancy problem in the uh, Middle East. 
And uh, my impression is that uh, you subscribe to the glass half full mm -hmm. uh, perspective that there are not that many of them, to be honest. That uh, uh, your research identified clearly 28 mm -hmm. uh, Uyghur or Chinese citizens in the ranks of uh, ISIL, and you said there may be hundreds mm -hmm. of them associated uh, via uh, tip with uh, Jakarta Nusra and its uh, associates. Well, uh, again, I. I defer to your judgment here, but uh, there are other voices out there, and uh, one of them is uh, Rohan Gunaratna. I don't know whether he is popular here in uh, this room, uh, but recently he said it's 500 in ISIL, and it can be really thousands of um, uh, Uyghurs in Syria uh, who uh, fight under the banners of uh, a tip. I can give you another example, and uh, this is a very spurious source. It's uh, the Russian Deputy Defense Minister, Antonov, Mm. What on record a couple of weeks ago saying, all told, there are 5,000 uh, uh, sorry, uh, Uyghur militants in Syria alone. I'm sure he's confused, and uh, he probably took that famous article from last time and mm. just extrapolated mm. that mm. every Uyghur on the territory of Syria mm. is uh, a nasty, turban-headed ruffian. Uh, but still, uh, uh, I think it would be safe and prudent for an academic uh, mm. to at least acknowledge that uh, alternative viewpoints exist and that perhaps uh, dozens or hundreds mm. uh, is uh, a kind of figures that can be questioned. Uh, the third uh, issue, and uh, again, I appreciate your caveat that uh, mm, uh, the paper is not dedicated to an analysis of China's relations uh, with the Middle East, uh, is uh, the, um, well, still the lens of international relations. And of course, Turkey-China relationship is uh, the elephant in the room, and you uh, covered this really well. Uh, but uh, again, in light of most recent developments, uh, I dare say that you cannot talk about the dynamics uh, uh, of uh, Uyghur militancy in the Middle East without taking account of what Saudi Arabia has to say on the subject. Uh, the relationship bet between China and Saudi Arabia has been kind of a roller coaster one, and uh, I think at the moment it's reaching its bottom. So, and with 8,000 or so Uyghurs uh, on the territory of Saudi Arabia and uh, the potential for financial sponsorship for Uyghurs fighting in Syria, I think it's a dimension that uh, really uh, should be covered. And uh, on the other side of uh, the um, uh, Iraq-Syria zone of confrontation, of course, there is Iran. And uh, as we all know, recently China has been making all sorts of overtures towards uh, uh, Iranians and uh, the tantalizing proposal of a united front featuring Iran, China, and uh, uh, Russia, and of course uh, the regime of, uh, ha of uh, Bashar al-Assad is uh, a very taunting geopolitical perspective that perhaps uh, needs to be covered mm. in the paper. Mm. I think uh, that's about it. Thank you. I mean, I'll touch on a number of the points that Kiel made, and uh, they're all well taken. Um, and you know, I, I think the paper will benefit substantially from it. I think in terms of the numbers point. Um, I would agree. I think, you know, I'm not saying that there's 28 <laughs> Uyghurs with ISIL. It is probably in the hundreds. How many hundreds? It's very difficult to know. Um, I mean, as I said, there's other data sets pointed to 100 plus in both cases. Um, and, you know, having, I know where they got their data from, and I know the data I have, and I know how it comes about. And it basically looks at a very specific slot of time, which seems to be sometime in mid-2013 to mid-2014. And so people are joining before, people are joining after. So, you know, it's, it's an incomplete data set. I, I, I would not doubt that. Are the numbers high as 5,000? That sounds like an awful lot to me. <laughs> um, Rohan Gunaratna's numbers, that sounds potentially about right. Mm. Um, maybe, though, though I, I really don't know that we know for sure. Mm. I think it's very difficult to have any accurate numbers whatsoever. Um, you know, and certainly saying 500 and 1,000 sounds very precise to me mm. <laughs> and a bit more of a kind of ballpark mm. figure mm. than a sort of precise uh, number. But I think that's also because, uh, you know, one of the interesting aspects which I, I always wondered about when we're looking at some of these individuals who are fighting is, are they all Uyghurs who've come from China? Mm. You know, as we know, Uyghur is a, it's a big diaspora. There's communities, there's substantial communities that have been in Turkey for a very long time. In Central Asia, if people are coming from there, would they identify as Uyghur? when they were pulling in an entry form or would they identify, you know, it's difficult to know. So I think there's sort of a whole question there around um, some of the data. In terms of the one about the ideology point, I think when we're looking at TIP in particular, I think they're very classically linking themselves mm -hmm. to Al-Qaeda proper. Um, if we look just, I, I noticed um, on uh, the Telegram account today, they released a video of, or a recording of Abu Qatada, al-Falistin, mm -hmm. received, you know, a message of, you know, supporting jihad. 
he's a very substantial Al Qaeda ideologue, and I think they clearly always link themselves to those individuals who we'd recognize as the sort of very much of the Al Qaeda strain of sort of jihad rather than Baghdadi, who we see them regularly sort of vilified. And as I say, Abdul Haq specifically had a whole video in which he mm. said this organization is, you know, kafar and um, is, you know, is, is a bad organization. And then when ISIL launched an attack, actually, uh, you may remember in Mecca back in um, July, I think it was, or in June, there was an incident of some sort in Mecca. Um, they put out a statement afterwards saying, you know, this is more evidence of how evil this organization is. They're even attacking the prophets, you know. So I think they target their hatred in that direction, and they're very much in the sort of strain of the classic al Qaedaist ideologues. On the question of the kind of Middle East uh, and, and Turkey and kind of how the relationship with China is being shaped, I, I think it's really difficult. I actually think when you're looking in the Middle East, um, I, uh, notwithstanding whatever rocky moments there might be at the moment, and you know, I think China has difficult relations with Iran and Saudi Arabia that sort of oscillate uh, back and forth um, historically, I think that the one thing that has always been fairly consistent is these governments have not been willing to come out and sort of too vocally support the Uyghur cause and too much sort of attack China. I think they all see China as an opportunity they want to sort of partner with and engage with, and that sort of seems to be the overriding priority in a lot of the cases. Turkey is the exception to this, which does seem willing to have a leadership which will vocalize its anger at the Uyghur cause and sort of support of it, um, in contrast to all of the other Middle Easterners who, who don't seem to want to do that. And I think that's because they, they would rather engage with China. The interesting question for me in some ways is if we take forward the logic I'm saying of TIP being one that's very close to Al-Qaeda and the sort of Nusra front that's fighting there, and if we go forward and see Nusra establishing some sort of a territory which is being controlled by them or which TIP sort of has a piece of it, um, you know, uh, Nusra, Ahar al-Sham, some of these other groups have backers in the Gulf. <laughs> you know, I don't think this is a big surprise to anyone. Um, and some of those, you know, there's a question about would China be able to leverage its relationship with some of these Gulf countries to try to influence the behavior of these groups on the battlefield. And that's an interesting dynamic that I wonder if we could see that playing out forwards, if they would be able to do it or if it would be something that they, uh, that they well, I can imagine they would want to do it, but if they would be able to, and whether those countries would be able to deliver uh, maybe in the same way that maybe historically we've seen Pakistan deliver on, uh, you know, Uyghur networks that they're concerned about there. And so I think that's an interesting space to watch going forwards, but I think the overriding uh, logic of you know, these countries wanting to engage with China as a sort of economic opportunity will be the kind of continuing priority, and I can't see that changing uh, for the Uyghur cause. There are other Muslim causes in the world which are equally ignored. I mean, mm. If you think about the plight of the Rohingya in Myanmar, which no one really talks about, and they've been having a horrible time for a very long time, uh, you know, there's no Muslim government which is getting up and shouting about that. So you know, I think that you know, some of these more pious uh, countries in the Middle East who sort of preach this thing of being protected of the Ummah, they don't always follow through on it. And I have a suspicion that Uyghurs will probably uh, fall in the category of ones that they will sort of overlook because a bigger geopolitical relationship is a priority. Raffaello, thanks for your presentation. Um, my name's Tim. I'm an analyst with the Department of Immigration and Border Protection. Um, considering in your research the limited number of Uyghurs that indicated a previous exposure to jihad or mm. a previous um, exposure to militancy, do you think Uyghurs are leaving China intentionally to take part in the conflict in Syria and Iraq, or are they leaving on more humanitarian refugee grounds and getting caught up in that jihadist narrative during their travels and finding themselves in Syria and Iraq? Um, I think uh, that's a really difficult question to know for sure, uh, frankly, um, because you know the sort of chains of how they got there I mean, I think, uh, and I'll be really interested to hear uh, Stephanie's presentation later in looking at the sort of Southeast Asian connection, because I think some of the recent uh, reports we've seen of Uyghurs showing up in sort of, you know, close proximity to Santoso and some of the networks, uh, the MIT networks we've seen in, um, in, in Indonesia, you know, you don't get there unless you know someone, <laughs> you know, and you have a specific goal in mind and they're not going to let anyone in and, you know, some wandering Uyghur who decides, oh, actually, maybe I'll go to Jihad. You know, I, so I think there's, there's got to be, some of these people are clearly going with some dedicated thing. But I don't think they all are, and I would suspect that some are getting sort of swept up along the way. Um, I would suspect some are being recruited in Turkey, quite frankly. You know, I think that there's probably, there's quite substantial networks of ISIL and Nusra networks there. Um, I would suspect that some are being drawn in there, but I, I don't know that we know for sure. In terms of the data that we have, these sort of entry and exit forms, um, it really doesn't identify that at all. Um, there's no question about why you're here. The only aspect which you could maybe touch on which would hint in this sort of direction would be one of the questions that's asked is, what's your level of understanding of Sharia? Mm. 
And in almost every case, it's basic. There's a couple who had a sort of more advanced, and there was one who was a Hafiz al-Quran, so memorized the whole Quran. Um, so maybe the ones who are religiously minded have, you know, but I'm superimposing, you know, on a very limited sort of data set. But, you know, it's, I think it's a very difficult question to know for sure. And I suspect there is no clean answer either. I suspect it's a bit of a mixed bag. I, I had a question just about, I, I thought it was very interesting that you um, looked to the bombing in Thai, Thailand as the first kind of example of targeting mm -hmm. um, Chinese citizens um, or any kind of Chinese uh, asset abroad. Um, I was wondering, I haven't looked that closely into that incident, mm -hmm. um, but I had seen you know various descriptions where you had all kinds of different uh, speculation about what had happened and was, was it just that there were Chinese there or was it targeting? So I, I'm just curious to hear why you seem very um, uh, sure that that was actually targeting uh, the Chinese. Um, I think that, you know, if we look at uh, the individuals who were arrested subsequently who were linked to it, um, who were uh, Uyghurs, who were part of sort of human smuggling network uh, that had sort of been cracked down very heavily on, um, I guess they assumed at the, at the behest of the sort of Chinese authorities. Um, you know, I think that there was, you know, a clear target. Also, it's an odd shrine, it's an odd target. It's an odd choice of targets, you know, a shrine like that. Uh, you know, Thailand, notwithstanding the sort of bombings you've seen recently, you know, the history of terrorism there is of separatism in the South um, and of political terrorism. And political terrorism in the sense of political parties, you know, lose an election or something and, you know, a bombing is kind of your way of expressing your anger. And I think that's what we've just seen recently in a whole spate of incidents that we've seen around the country. Um, so this kind of a very targeted political act, again, it's, it was different, you know, it was materially different. Even if we look back at history, you know, there was a long history of Al-Qaeda networks, of Hezbollah networks, of other terrorist groups using Thailand as a kind of staging point. And the narrative always was, don't attack here, because this is a useful conduit point a useful place for transit and other activity. And so, you know, you don't want to disrupt that and get the authorities on everyone's case. So everyone just kind of leave it alone. And so that, you know, decision. And so, you know, within that context, I think you'd seen the authorities that had been clamping down. They'd been sending Uyghurs back to China. They'd been sort of clamping down on this network. And I think that was kind of an expression of anger against both the sort of Thai authorities, but also specifically the Chinese. And Erwan's trying, you know, look, I knew the Chinese afterwards who, uh, who you know, who, who sort of contacted me to talk about it, they all said, God, yeah, everyone in China has heard of that shrine because they all go visit it. That's, you know, if you go to Bangkok, you go check out the Yerman Shrine if you're Chinese and, or, Thai, or Taiwanese or Hong Kong or, you know, so they felt instantly that it was kind of directly targeted at them. So all of that, you know, puts a picture to me that says that it was quite specifically looking to strike at some sort of a Chinese target. So three sort of slightly intertwined um, questions. Um, First of all, I, you, you touched on this well, I guess bit. I asked you three, didn't I? So revenge. <laughs> revenge. Um, uh, the first, I mean, you touched on it a bit, but I, I, I kind of w was curious to get your assessment a little bit more on sort of what affected TIP's sort of somewhat heightened standing um, in the Al Qaeda network. Um, I mean, do, do you attribute that to the specific individuals like Abdul? hack on their position within the group, to relations between the group in, in North Waziristan, or specifically the role that they've played and their relative effectiveness in uh, campaigns in, in Syria. I mean, just kind of which elements do you think have, have fed into that? Um, and then related to that, um, what, is the, what is your assessment of how the TRP are functioning on the battlefield um, in Syria? What, what's your sense of their status, reputation, what particular role they play. I've kind of heard some assessments that are that they are actually particularly operationally effective there. Um, uh, I mean, there is this sort of description that you sometimes hear from the Chinese side of them being cannon fodder and doing sort of advance actions in various campaigns and things. But I, I'm kind of curious as to what your assessment is in so, I mean, it's difficult to, to, to assess, but in, insofar as you have a sense of, of that. Um, and then lastly, uh, on the bombing campaign from the Russians and um, and and the regime. I mean, what, what's your at the beginning of this year? There were various analysts, uh, including the UN counterterrorism people, who were kind of expecting that there'd be an outflow of many of the Uyghurs from Syria as a result of the level of attacks that were being launched on their positions and um, and things like that. I mean, it doesn't seem to have happened in the end on on that scale. But I'd just be curious to get your 
uh, take on the uh, what, what sort of impact the particularly over the last year uh, so since the beginning of 2016 um, what impact some of uh, what's played out on the battlefield and you mentioned Aleppo and 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 some of the particular uh, cases in, in which there has obviously been kind of specific targeting of some of their positions both mm. um, uh, by the Syrian government and by the Russians mm. um, thank you I I think on, on, on the first question about the why is the group sort of getting this elevated standing in uh, uh, the Al Qaeda network. Um, I, I, you know, this one is I don't know exactly. <laughs> um, I would suspect it probably is something to do with their effectiveness on the battlefield, which kind of goes to answer some of your next question. I think they have shown themselves to be a fairly effective force. I think when there was the fight for Jazeera Sugar, um, they were quite clearly the ones that were sort of able to break through and were the ones that really sort of pushed through and took um, a lot of, uh, of the city. And I think a lot of the other groups sort of praised them. And you saw they used a couple of suicide bombs in that attack and they put out a video after sort of praising these individuals. But you saw those photos show up in other groups' videos as well. And so I think the group was kind of clearly seen as quite an effective uh, sort of fighting force. And so I think the narrative of them as kind of cannon fodder doesn't really hold. I think the other point to make is they seem a fairly coherent, independent unit that's fighting on the battlefield. You know, and I think they align themselves with the sort of Nusra and Salafi jihadi strain on the battlefield rather than the sort of FSA. And they fought as the sort of under the umbrella that you see, you know, Haral Sham and uh, Nusra fighting under. Um, but they do also operate independently. You know, they are a sort of effective, coherent fighting force that is able to control territory. A, a, a journalist I spoke to who'd gone in and was managed to get into Nusra territory said that, you know, uh, the, the place where he was, at a certain point he was sort of trying to go down a road and the sort of his, his, you know, his guides or guards or whatever um, said to him, no, no, we can't down there, that's where the tip guys are. You know, and they kind of control their territory and we don't want to sort of impede on it. We, you know, we, work, we fight together with them, but we let them do their own thing and we do our own thing, you know. So I think there's a sense of it being a fairly coherent effort, a coherent unit that is quite effective on fighting in the battlefield. And then I suggest that, you know, you've seen it showing up all over the country, which maybe helps answer the question about numbers. You know, if you're able to project a force that can launch attacks in Latakia, in Aleppo, all the way up on the border with Turkey, you know, it can really launch all over the country. That suggests you've got a pretty substantial force to play with or to use and deploy. And then the other thing is if you look at the, the, the material that they have, you know, they've got a pretty big piece of hardware. You know, they managed to get their hands on APCs, tanks, trucks, you know, and some of it's probably stolen. Um, some of it's taken on the battlefield, we know. But, you know, there's quite a bit of sort of equipment. So I think they're a fairly effective and coherent uh, sort of fighting force. And, you know, the sort of volume of uh, material that they're churning out um, in terms of, you know, videos and others indicate not only that they've got substantial numbers, that they've got good equipment, but also that they're doing the state building part of it as well. You know, they've sort of released videos showing kids being trained, of them, you know, showing them cooking, of them having a good time, you know, generally, you know, being jihadis on a battlefield, but very much in the sort of state uh, building model. So I would suspect that all of that, I think, would suggest that it's a fairly coherent and strong entity. Um, I would suspect that probably has played into Al Qaeda wanting to, you know, embrace it uh, more tightly. Um, uh, I think in terms of the impact of uh, the Russian bombing, um, you know, I think that I can't think of anything specific, uh, frankly, looking at the impact that's had on, on TIP in particular. What I would suggest, however, is that the sort of Russian bombing has been very effective in eliminating a lot of the moderate forces on the ground um, in Syria um, and strengthen and in reducing them. Because in a lot of those cases, what you're seeing is the sort of FSA units getting bombed to hell. And then the guys that are left basically get swept up by one of the other groups, you know, be it Ahar Sham, be it um, uh, Nusra or anyone else. And so they kind of go from being a guy who's maybe a moderate group to being somebody who's involved in an Al Qaeda network. You know? um, and so that is kind of strengthening those. And I think that TIP has probably benefited from that because a lot of those groups are ones that are its allies and it's fighting with on the battlefield. Um, you know, in terms of them being targeted directly, um, again, I haven't seen it have a material impact myself. I just wonder, have you ever searched or researched about Uyghurs inside East Turkestan? And do you know how do they feel? How do they identify themselves? Or you just searched or researched only a few Uyghur militant groups or organizations, according to your presentation. Um, my question is related to the roots of terrorism in China. Um, let me put it this way. How do you feel when you go to church on Sunday, then you get arrested if your wife or sister 
or mom or any female audiences here in this room is forcibly put on a long dress or scarf on their head by the um, security officers, how do you feel if it's against your nature or freedom? How do you feel when you see over 15 million immigrants in the last few decades and you see a new cities um, next to every existing cities in capital cities? And how do you feel if you're forced to call your country by another language? For example, like oh, Dalia, you can't call Australia. And you just said Chinese Muslim, you, met, you just mentioned Chinese Muslim, we are not Chinese Muslim, we are Turkic Muslim in East Turkestan. There is some Chinese Muslim called Hui, you know it. Mm -hmm. um, by the way, I'm not supporting any terrorist organizations and terrorism. I'm against all kinds of uh, terrorism, including the state, um, state terrorism carried out by China towards Uyghurs. My question is very simple. Like, how do you feel? Don't forget you are a terrorist, and what would you do? Are you, like, do you still live in peacefully, or? I don't know. Thank you. Um, I mean, it's more of a statement, really, than a question. Um, I mean, I think, clearly, uh, I have done research about Uyghurs in China. Here, I was talking specifically about the sort of links to Al-Qaeda and looking at some of these sorts of networks. I think that, you know, uh, I have no doubt that some of the actions that the Chinese state is undertaking in Xinjiang are probably exacerbating some of these problems. Um, and I actually have spoken to people in China who would agree with that sort of assessment. So, yeah. Helen Carpelli from Defense. Um, I have a couple of questions. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, first one, um, I'm, I was born in China, uh, Siberian China, Siberian uh, on China side and grew up in uh, the Chinese communist region. And that history about, uh, um, how do you pronounce that? Uh, Uyghurs? Uh, Uyghurs? Um, we call it Weiwurzu. Um, were not taught. So my question is how long, sorry for my ignorance, I never, I didn't study that history. How long have uh, these Uyghurs uh, been living in China? And uh, thousands of years I have heard and the second question is, we have, um, we have in Australia, we have 476,000 Muslims living in our country, and I'm Australian citizen. Um, so I just want to ask one question. How long um, do we, of course, you know, we have a social coherence issues in China and in Australia, and we can't ignore that, and that, issues cause some friction, flicked. Um, how, what we have learned, Australia, you know, lessons learned from China. And uh, can we, um, I mean, in your country, are you from UK? Yep. Yeah, so in your country, same. So can, do you have an answer for that? Uh, first question is how long have <laughs> Uyghurs lived in, in China for? Well, I, I, I think our former uh, last question probably helped you answer that question uh, better than me, but I think Uyghurs have always been in Xinjiang, what is now called Xinjiang, which previously wasn't, for a very long time. Um, David Brophy, who is somewhere here, has written a very good book about the Uyghur nation, which I'd recommend reading to sort of get a clearer view of, of that, uh, of the, uh, the sort of origins and ethnicity of uh, the community there. But I think they've been there for, yes, as far as I know, forever, I don't know. <laughs> You know, I think they're one of the sort of Turkey Central Asian peoples that ultimately, when the borders were defined, ended up being uh, uh, within China. Um, I think to your second question, which you know, if I if if I sort of interpreted as I, I thought I answered, it was a question of what do you do about kind of radicalization, about people being drawn to these sorts of extremist ideas, and the answer is it's very difficult because it's very different in every individual case. You know, um, in the UK we have a very similar problem that you have here in Australia about radicalization. Um, of people who are going to fight in Syria and Iraq, of people who are trying to launch attacks against their home countries. And if you look at the cases and individuals, it's, it's often there's a different reason in each and every case. And so it's very difficult. And so there is no sort of clean answer to this. Um, you see communities and countries that have very, you know, solid, multi-ethnic, coherent societies that produce this problem. And you have ones that are very polarized that produce this problem. 
So it's, it's very difficult, frankly, and there is no sort of clean answer to it. Um, and radicalization is unfortunately a problem which I think we're going to see uh, continuing to express itself to um, varying degrees.